Welcome to Hard Questions, where we gather pastors together to take on your tough questions and answer them right from the Bible. I'm Tom Hollis, the moderator, and today our panelists include... Dr. Weimar Glaze, Bethany Baptist Church in Pittsburgh. Ray Heipel, Providence Presbyterian Church in Robinson Township. Pete Jacklone, South Hills Assembly Guy Church, Bethel Park, PA. It's Anthony Gilbert, pastor of Another Level in the North Hills area. Well, we're going to have a great program today. We're going to take on hard questions from our hotline and uh, most that deal with everything from church membership to giants. Okay, <laughs> so uh, let's start with this. Hello, I have a couple of questions too. One, my name is Jacob also, by the way. My first question is, in, Ge in Genesis, it talks about God destroyed all the giants in the flood, but later on, what about David and Goliath? I thought he was a giant. May you answer that question? Jacob, I love it. I love that you <laughs> called in. I, I just love it. And, you know, get your, get your application ready for seminary right now because that's great. Uh, Dr. Glaze, about the giants, the Nephilim. Yeah. Jacob, that's a very insightful question and one that took a lot of thought. So I appreciate you asking mm -hmm. us that. Mm -hmm. And you are absolutely right that during the flood, all the giants were destroyed. They were called mm -hmm. Nephilim. Uh, and when the flood took place, they were all destroyed. So how did they reappear again is a question, which again is a very good question. Now, when we think about the people that went on the boat, it was Noah, his wife, and Noah's three sons and their wives. And so if all the giants were destroyed, you know, during the flood, uh, it, would, it would make sense that within the genes of one of Noah's sons, especially the son of Ham, because we see that uh, Goliath actually came from the Canaanite race who was uh, descended from Ham. And so within Ham was still the genes to reproduce the giants. So even after the flood, uh, there was uh, genes that the that no, one of Noah's sons possessed to be able to reproduce the giants. So thank you for that. Thank you for that question. Wow, that that is great. Great question. Great answer. Any other thoughts on this? Yeah, I would say the same thing. That um, there's the genetic information that we all have, as Dr. Glay said, genes or DNA, and and that's why people look different today because different groups of people went different places and. You know, Asians don't look like Africans and Africans don't look like Europeans because there's different amounts of genes that bring out certain traits. And one of those traits is height. And even today, Jacob, I don't know if you know this, but in Guatemala, the average man is five foot three inches tall and the average woman is four foot ten and a half. In the Netherlands, the average mm. man is six feet and a half inch and the average woman is five foot seven. So it's even possible, it seems to me today, if a bunch of tall people went on some island mm -hmm. and had uh, some They'd kind of you know, new nation that we might see giants again because that genetic information is there. Mm -hmm. I, I got some Scandinavian in there. I don't know. That's, <laughs> kind uh, of tall. Yeah, see that? We got, we got. Yeah, you, you know, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Let me jump in real quick. Years ago, Elaine and I did some, uh, a college class uh, in, in Sweden up in the Laplands and oh my gosh, I felt like I was in a land. Every woman was about six foot tall, and, and the men were six, six and bigger. And I tell you, I had a neck ache. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I, I, I just oh. love it so much, Jacob. And actually, we've got another question from Jacob. So let's go to the second one. Why did God create the devil and Adam and Eve even know they knew the world was going to be like this? Thank you. Bye. <laughs> I, Call uh, again, Pastor kid. Jay, why don't you, uh, again, I love the questions. Yes, yeah, so I believe what he's saying there is why did God create the devil? Adam even though the world would turn out the way that it did. And, uh, you know, you have to remember too, Jacob, that in God's mind, you know, he had a plan to mm -hmm. redeem man even before the devil ever even came out. That's so right. he gave us an opportunity to be redeemed even in the midst of all the stuff that's going on in the world. And also something else that we don't always take into consideration is, you know, when Satan fell, he was the worshiper in heaven. Yes. And yeah. God needs worshipers. And you can never be a worshiper until you have options and choices. And so if God is saying, all right, here's all the good things in life, and this is presented by me, here's all the stuff that Satan has to offer. Worship is, boy, I'd really like to have some of that stuff over there, but God, I love you more. And you can never be a worshiper until you have something compete with priority with what's important in your heart. And so God put Satan in the middle and said, okay, 
Adam, I want you all to choose me. Eve, I want you to choose me. But Satan said, I want you to choose me. Now we have to make a decision. And that's how we become a worshiper. And I believe that when we leave this planet, if we have served God and made him our Lord and Savior, we will be the replacement for the fallen angels and for the worshiping spirit that is now missing in heaven that Lucifer was once a part of that now has become Satan. So now we will be the ones mm -hmm. that will take his place. That we have not bowed the knee to Lucifer, Satan now. We have not bowed the knee to the things of the world and we have chosen God. And so that is the reason why God's allowed this to happen and all of it is going to come together. He knows exactly what's gonna happen even in the midst of all the suffering and the torment, and everything that's going on. He has a plan and he has sent his son to redeem us and that we can also be overcomers in this world as well. Yeah, that's real good. And, and God didn't really create the devil. He created Lucifer who you know right. was was right. an archangel who fell right yeah I would just emphasize that too Jacob that God never made anything bad God doesn't make anything evil God makes only things that are good and beautiful and true and it's Satan who made himself evil and he became the father of lies and liars and, and murderers and Adam and Eve sinned and that they fell and became evil but we never want to say that God did that. God made them good, and they should have uh, chosen the good, and they should have followed the good, but they desired and, and chose evil, and we still do that. You know, That's Jacob, right. I'm sure you choose things that are bad, and you disobey mom and dad sometimes, even though you know you shouldn't. And so we just want to recognize God always calls us to do what is right and good, and whenever we see anything bad, that was from a creature. That wasn't from God. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Pete. Well, I agree with what guys say. We have a choice. And, and Jacob, as, as Pastor Glaze and everyone has, has specifically talked to you, you have a choice to do good. And remember, God says, he says, I would that you would do good. Choose curses or blessings. And then you see the heartbeat of God. God longs for us That's to right. always That's choose right. to do good. Yeah, Amen. That's his so, desire. It's so true. And I just want to ask Dr. Glaze, why don't you speak to Jacob for a little bit there again? And just, I just congratulate him on his questions and on his heart to follow God. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Jacob, you are a uh, fascinating young man. You know, a lot of young people uh, your age, uh, they're not thinking about the scripture in such a way. And so it just is a blessing to hear you ask these questions because, again, it shows that you are thinking uh, at a level which is uh, uh, where God wants us to wrestle with the scriptures. And, and even the questions that you ask, you know, go beyond the surface. Uh, they go to a deeper level. And so uh, I just want to uh, congratulate you on just being one. And I'm sure, let me say something uh, about your parents, too, that you must have some good parents, you know, that have kept you grounded in the word also. So uh, I take my hat off to your parents also. Amen. That's right. Amen. All of us up here, we take yeah. our hat off to you, yeah. uh, parents, and to Jacob. Well, coming up in 60 seconds, we ask, are there situations where people should not be admitted into church membership? We'll be right back. Welcome back to Hard Questions. We're taking your calls from the Hard Question Hotline. So I'd like to invite you, if you'd like to leave us your question, we encourage you to call 412-349-4326. Let me give you that again, 412-349-4326. We would love to answer your questions on the air. Let's go to the next one. In my church, we had a man and a woman that were living together, but were not allowed to join the church because it was considered adultery. Also, we have a person that plays in a secular band, secular music, but he is not allowed to play in our church. Could you please consult on these two problems and give us your solutions and your answers? Thank you. Well, thank you so much for the question. Pete, consult away. <laughs> First Corinthians chapter five. All right. Um, there is a morality situation here that, and I think the church needs to stop. And please hear my heart before you say I'm a Sadducee or a Pharisee. We need to stop playing patty cake. Fornication for the believer is fornication for the non-believer. To say that because you're a believer, you, you, you can fornicate. The Bible does not teach that. Sin is sin. 
And in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, it says, it's actually reported, uh, and he's speaking to the church, there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality is not even among the Gentiles. And, and then if you read that, I, I want you to take a look at it for yourself. Paul says, I'm not even there. I've already made a judgment call. It's a biblical judgment call. Put him out of the church. And the reason why he says that, he goes on and he explains why. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I remember as a pastor many, many, many years ago, my kids, they knew the people that were sleeping around. And, and they would even, I mean, as, as 10-year-olds and 11-year-olds, and they would say, Daddy, is that right? So how can I say just because so-and-so comes to church and I don't want to rock the boat per se, how can I later on teach my children it's wrong to fornicate if I allow it to continue on in church. Come on, church. There's a st it's not my standard. It's God's standard. And, and I know I may sound a little, ooh, may, maybe my heart's thumping. But again, this is what the Word of God says. No more patty cake. We really, and it goes back to what we talked about before, warning the wicked man. Being, I've gone to couples and said, hey, listen, you know what? You need to get married or move out, one or the other. But you cannot be a member here. Now, the second part of that, about the musician, I have no problem with that. If that is their talent, if that is, is what they do for a living, if they're a country western singer, there's nothing wrong with them continuing on in their profession and being able to minister in yeah, church. There's clearly two different things here. Yeah. Ray, why don't we go right. to you next? Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I mean, I don't know. I can only go by the way the questions were set before yeah. us. But if, it's, if that's the case, that a man who simply plays secular music isn't allowed to play in the church, well, that's clearly wrong. There's, yeah. you know, nothing wrong. There's no sin of playing secular music. Mm -hmm. um, I would assume that he can't play that during worship, you know, play, you know, I don't know, you ain't nothing but a hound dog or something. <laughs> ah. I mean, yeah, sure, that's inappropriate for worship, but I mean, to exclude him for that, that's, yeah, that's, Unless that's not wrong. about Satan. You know, yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's right. No. But the other issue, like Pete said, I mean, you know, that's sin. You can't live in sin and be a member of the church. The church would be unfaithful for that. You know, uh, Paul talks about uh, fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness. Let it not even be named among you. Preach it. You know, and we do church discipline in our church and it's a real difficulty because the next church down the road will just welcome them in yeah. as uh, members. and say, yeah, it's, oh, wasn't that church so mean to you? I mean, if we don't tell people who are living together uh, and, and not married, if we don't warn them that God's judgment is going to be on them unless they repent from that sin, I mean, I'm, I'm patting them on the back as they're walking into hell. You have to repent to be saved. That's part of being saved. And, you know, would you want murderers to be a member of your church? Oh, I'm a murderer. You know, I want to join your church. Sure, you know, we love everyone. Um, you have to repent from that. And that's part of the gospel that we repent. Let me, let me ask you, where at, 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 I agree 100%, but a, a timing issue here. Mm -hmm. So a couple walks into your church, and they start attending. They attend for three months. Uh, and then, you know, in, in the course of things, you find out they're not married. And like, at where, at what point do you say, hey, I've got to confront them? We've had this issue happen. And, um, you know, I do the new members class all the time. And, and people were, you know, you talk to different people. And we had a couple who were excited about the church. And they were coming regularly for weeks and weeks. And, of course, you know, you don't know these things. And, uh, and then it comes out that, oh, by the way, they're living together and they're not married. And I just point blank said to them, well, you can't join the church. Either you separate or you get married. You either move out and separate or you get married. Uh, and then we can talk about joining the church. But until then, I, I can't even consider it, okay. you know. Yeah. So I just made so it very it's clear. So it comes to light, basically. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and to, you know, it was a good, happy ending. They got married. Yeah, and good. You know, I have a little bit of a, a little bit of twist on this. And what I mean by that is, of course, anybody that knows me knows. So everybody that's watching, I am not condoning that you should live together. But living together is not a sin. We have to make that clear. Just simply living together. It is the sexual act that you will commit that is a sin. Two people living under the same roof, you can't say, you're going to hell for that. What did they, what's their error? Mm -hmm. What's their error? If you had a guy that doesn't even date that girl and they live in the same house, but they're sharing the rent, he has one place, she has a place, does that make them a sinner? No, no I'm talking about well, that. Well, no, but, yeah. but, but no, but I'm saying that's important that we yeah. mention that. So, I mean, because a lot of people say they call it shacking up. Well, I agree. If you're now, do I believe two people being married should or not being married should live together if they're dating? No, because you're probably going to sin. You know, you're opening the door to that, and I don't condone that. But I think that's very, very important. So, my thing is also this if they're not committing sin, they don't have to get out. That's just my opinion. Now, as far as like what they require in church membership, 
Now, maybe a church says, we don't want that. So membership is a man-made thing. That is something that every church, you go different, what you're required to do for you, membership, what's required to do for you, I'm sure they're all different. That is something, but he's talking, when we look at Paul in the scriptures, he's talking about the church. Yeah. You know, now we have all these different churches with different names and mm. you know, it's, it's a little bit of a different setup. So I think it's important that we point that out as well as like even with uh, secular music, I agree that not playing secular music, but I also believe if a guy is in a bar where it's a strip bar, he's playing, he should not be a member. You know, we have to also look at everything individually. What is the sin being committed? It's not just, well, you can't play secular music. Well, some things are right until they become wrong. So I think that's also important to look at as well. And once again, I'm not dumbing down or watering down. No, no, no. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying we have to be careful because everybody's situations are different. So I might differ a little bit from where you are in regards to it just, well, they're not, well my question is, are you sleeping together? You yeah. need to be moving towards that. Well, as we, as we reach out to the community and our church has done this a, a lot and we see new people coming that don't have any knowledge of what it means to be a Christian and they're welcome but if they're going to join the church, then there's right. obviously some things we so have to talk about. So are they not saved? No, that, I don't. So I, why that's couldn't they God's, join the church then? That's God's business. So I mean, that's why I have to, we have to look yeah. at that. We have to be honest here. Well, if, if we're looking at something along that line, and you get somebody that comes in, they give their life to Jesus, and one woman doesn't work, and the other guy does, and we're saying, well, you can't be a part of this until you get everything right. Well, if that's the case, any person in your church that has any sin in their life we have to get rid of well, them. Then that's, a, that's an interesting question because it brings up, do we have to be perfect to serve God? I mean, in order to join the church, do we have to have everything perfectly right? Maybe you can I, give I us some. some feedback on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I think these guys covered it. <laughs> okay. I mean, I I what, what more can be said yeah. than has already been said. Okay, I'm not setting the standard. My yeah. church is not setting the standard. When, when there's a biblical standard there, then that standard has to be upheld. The Bible says, and this is what Paul says under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, when it comes time specifically, uh, he who sins sexually sins against their body. There's consequences for certain sins. And again, if we embrace, now we embrace the sinner to, to become repentive. But what I'm trying to say is there's not a difference. You cannot have a difference between... Uh, Christian fornication well, and non-Christian fornication. we're all saying fornication. But, but yeah. Tom, the, yeah. the question is not, are they in sexual sin? They were living together. It was considered adultery. That's why I wanted to be yeah. careful about that. Yeah. Because we can't penalize for stuff the Bible does not clearly say is a oh, sin. No, no, no. So I, I that's agree that's, with you, I, I agree no, with I'm, you. I'm so yeah. everybody knows, I am 100% like, you, you don't have sex before marriage. You yeah. don't have sex with somebody else's wife. Yeah. I'm totally for yeah. that. But, but that's the only point I want to make clear. Yeah, because, I'm Jay, let, let's, let's be truthful. Let's all, all of us be truthful. Uh, sexual sin is more prevalent in the church today than ever totally before. Agree. And totally. we're, and in some and way, there somehow. there needs to be a standard. And right. again, we're separating this completely from whether you go yeah. play polka music on Saturday <laughs> night or something, okay? Yeah. So this yeah. is, you know, yeah. uh, this is a clear biblical standard. And I, I think there, the question comes, can they attend? Can they, right, you know, right. where, where is that line drawn? I think different churches probably draw that a little differently. I mean, we are called to abstain from the appearance of evil. Yes. You know, and, and I've dealt with that question, Jay, and I, and I would differ with you a little bit where I've, I've had a couple say, well, you know, we'll just, we won't have sex anymore. We'll just stay together. And I'm like, it's the appearance of evil. You're living together. We all know what that means. And that's always been the case. And so, and plus I said to them, look, you know, you don't want to get used to living with this woman I said to the man, and not have sex with her. If you plan on marrying her someday, mm -hmm. you're setting a really bad precedent here. For sure. You know, this for is, sure. you for can't sure. pretend like your brother and sister when you're actually romantically in love with each other, but we're not going to go there, you know? Yeah. Yeah, uh, and, sure. and I would make a distinction too between living in sin versus, versus someone who sins. We don't say you have to be perfect, mm -hmm. but you know, here's, a, here's 1 John 3, 9. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. There you go. Yeah. You know, I'll that's the thing you I'll can't do. Good. Of course that's you're all sinners, good. but right. there's a difference between I'm embracing homosexuality and you know, I'm tempted by this, but I hate it and I'm fighting it. Yeah. This guy's a member, that guy's not. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. I agree that's, with that. That's a good yeah. point, good point. Well, coming up, we're gonna, uh, after our break, we're gonna ask, does the Bible tell us we are to claim our healing? Stay tuned. Well, welcome back to Hard Questions. Let's take our last hotline question. Hi, my question is this. There are shows 
that I watch where it is said that we've already received our healing for physical ailments, um, emotional, et cetera, and that we just need to believe that we have already received those because those have been taken care of in Christ. Yet Paul had a thorn of some type, which we don't know what type of possible ailment it was that he, God chose not to heal him of in order to keep him humble. So I'm a little confused on how we can say that we have always received our healing for everything in Christ, although I know we'll be healed on the other side if we're not healed here. But there are many shows um, with prominent pastors who claim that if you're not being healed, you just haven't believed that you have received this healing in Christ. And um, it's very confusing. Thank you very much. Well, I really appreciate the scripture. And as the program director here, let me say this about the shows. We welcome a lot of shows as long as they are within the, the realm of orthodox true doctrine, but there's differences of opinion on certain things like healing. So we'll go there right now. So Ray. Yeah, and, and again, I, I'm just going by what I'm hearing. If what you're saying you know, to the caller is that a minister is saying that as a Christian, you should never get sick. As a Christian, if you are sick, you can make yourself healthy. Then I would say that's false teaching. Uh, that's not true. Uh, we have uh, clear examples in scripture. Um, Paul says in Philippians 2 about Epaphroditus, a fellow minister. Mm -hmm. He says, he was longing for you all. He was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. Indeed, he was sick almost unto death. Now listen how Paul resolves it. He doesn't say, but he declared his healing and healed himself. He said, but God had mercy on him. And not only on him, but me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. You know, God can mercifully heal us, but he doesn't have to. Even the Apostle Paul, who was, uh, I believe, you know, he had the gift to, uh, to do certain kinds of miracles, which I don't believe we can do today. But even the Apostle Paul, who did heal people miraculously, he couldn't do it to everyone. 2 Timothy 4.20, Erastus has stayed in Corinth, but Trophimus, I left, left sick. sick. Yes. In Miletus, Paul says, I left him sick because I couldn't heal him. God didn't give me the ability to do that. So, you know, I would say to you that we, we do get sick as Christians. We do get cancer as Christians. Someday, every Christian, unless Jesus comes back soon or before then, they're going to die. They're going to die of sickness. They're going to die of a disease. They're going to die of, of an uh, accident. You know, things happen to Christians in this world too. And, and to say that, you know, you should always be healthy and wealthy or whatever because you're a believer, that's just not true. All right, uh, good, good point, Dr. Glaze. Well, you know, Paul told uh, Timothy to take a little wine for your stomach's sake. So, Often infirmity. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, how come he just didn't go touch him and whatever his problem was, heal him? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as a pastor, you know, I've uh, prayed with people uh, who had faith. I mean, they had great faith. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were sick. And, you know, I went in the hospital. I prayed with them that, that uh, you know, I always pray that, Lord, your will be done in their life. Mm -hmm. And I, so I think that anytime we deal with healing, it has to be according to the will of God. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, some people will say, well, it's always God's will. But, you know, I would differ with that just based on some of the things that Ray mm -hmm. said. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I've, I've prayed with people and then a couple of days later, they went home to be with the mm -hmm. Lord. So, yeah, 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 uh, yeah. you know, God it does not always heal. Uh, but ev eventually he does heal when they go to heaven. It's not that you had a lack of faith or that they had a lack of yeah. faith. It was yeah. just at, at that time, it was the time. Now, Pete, as I come to you, your assemblies of God. That's one of the distinctive <laughs> doctrines is divine is healing. Divine healing. Yeah. So yeah. Well, talk to so, me about so this. So we do believe in divine healing, but we also can take a look at the, at the life of Elisha, he, uh, who did twice the miracles of Elijah, and he died of a sickness known of man. So what I'm trying to say is, yes, is healing there? He, I believe healing is available but to heal, heal at will, nowhere in the scripture does it say. And then again, some of these teaching of some of these people, they make you believe that every time you pray, they got to be healed every time. And, and some of them have had some great things, even in Paul's life. We discussed what Paul was talking about. He would take up his apron because he was a tent maker and he would cut it up and he would send portions of his apron to people that when the cloth touched them, they were healed. Yeah. So, but again, the and thing, I'm okay with that. If someone yeah, wants yeah. to send that to me, yeah. but it's got to be real. It's got to be. We got to stay something. away from formulas. Right, right. For, exactly. Look at Matthew chapter eight. You have three distinct healings there. The leper, uh, the servant, and then Peter's mother-in-law. So again, when, when we try to create a formula, I believe we're in false doctrine. 
Thanks, Pete. 20 seconds. 20 seconds. All right. Wrap it up for us. Real quickly, I think also mentioned about Paul. I don't think that's a good scripture to use for believers all the time. First of all, you haven't written two thirds of the New Testament. You haven't been caught up into third heaven. You, you, when you had that, he get, was given that because of the abundance of revelation. So I think we have to compare that as well. We don't have time to go into anything else, but that's yeah, something that we need no, to look that, at. <laughs> this is important because we have heard a lot of people I've, yeah. In the charismatic movement, especially about that it's always God's will to heal, but yet we see a lot of people that don't get healed. And then you start, is, are we blaming this person because they didn't have faith? They, or, and that's what they do. What about us? Did we not have faith when we prayed? So that it's, a, it's a very important question. Well, we like to end the program with a scripture. And today we go to Ecclesiastes where it said, he has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. That's Ecclesiastes 3.11, interesting book you should read it sometime. And we hope that you enjoyed today's program and we wanna hear from you. Email us your questions like Jacob to hardquestions at ctvn.org or call into the hotline at 412-349-4326. We have enjoyed being with you. Please send us your questions here on Hard Questions.